Hi, everyone, and welcome to the first webinar in this series on working with trans youth and their families. So I'm Sally Guy. I'm the Director of Policy here at the Canadian Association of Social Workers. And we're really thankful that uh, Dr. Annie Pullen Salfasso is offering this series for social workers across Canada. So yesterday, of course, was both the National Day of the Child and also the Transgender Day of Remembrance, uh, which is a time to remember all those lost to transphobia, violence, and prejudice. Um, and it's a time to commit to doing better in the future. Um, so it, it does feel fitting that today, that knowing that education and understanding is a small piece of the puzzle in fighting prejudice, um, that we're offering this webinar to help folks learn a bit more um, about trans youth and how to, to make their futures better. Clearly, this is a topic of interest. We've got just about 500 folks signed up today for the live event. Uh, and this first session is going to be very broad. Um, it's going to have time for audience questions at the end. And every question is a good question. Uh, before I enter introduce Annie properly, there are some housekeeping details to go over. So the information you need, how to download the slide deck, how to get your certificate of attendance, uh, all that information is written down in the welcome widget. Uh, you can access that by clicking on the loudspeaker icon at the bottom of your screen. I also encourage you to take a second, just click on the different icons at the bottom and different tools are going to pop up. Um, you can see that you can drag or resize all the boxes on your screen now. So you could, for instance, minimize me and make the slide deck bigger. Um, also take a look at the resources in the widget. I've linked some of the stuff that Annie is going to be talking about. Um, and I've also linked the sign up pages for part two and three of this series in case you hadn't signed up yet. So with that, it's time to introduce Annie properly. Uh, Annie Pollen Saint-Fasson holds a PhD in ethics and social work from De Montfort University in the UK. And she is a full professor of social work at the University of Montreal. And her work focuses on the development of anti-oppressive theories and approaches that promote ethical and emancipatory practice in social work, and then applying those methodologies towards uh, better understanding the experiences of oppression and resistance of trans youth and their families. She is one of the co-founders of Gender Creative Kids Canada, which I link to in the resources widget so you can find their website. Uh, and she's also the co-editor of the book Supporting Transgender and Gender Creative Youth, Schools, Families, and Community in Action. So with that, we are really excited to have you here, Annie, and I will pass it over to you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, so I will not repeat the introduction. I'm really pleased to be here today. Uh, I'm going to try to make it uh, dynamic, although it's uh, a little bit different than having uh, an audience in front. But today it's really about looking at basic concept so we can all get to uh, a general and common understanding of, um, of, of trans youth and uh, what it is to be trans uh, in the life of a young person. And this is going to take us at the next uh, meeting to understanding more in depth the different experiences of trans youth. We are going to go through different research uh, that are currently being undertaken uh, in Montreal, but also across Canada. And we are going to finish uh, this web series by looking at families. And why we decided to organize that this way is that in social work, we're really about trying to enhance individual and collective well-being. And it is, you know, we all know that often individual difficulties are rooted in, you know, broader issues such as family and community. So we felt that it was really important to really explore the experience over and beyond trans youth to be able to make sense and intervene more efficiently. So I am sure everyone has noticed that over the past few years, probably 2012, 13 in Canada, we've started to see a lot of media talking about trans youth, a lot of policy documents. We are seeing more and more scholarly journal uh, about gender diverse and trans children and young people. I think from this document, we can, um, we can understand there's a consensus about the fact that this can be a very vulnerable population and that they've got needs that are often poorly understood, uh, not only by social worker, by, by, but by broader kind of professional uh, groups. Uh, we also need to make sure we understand that their need vary greatly. So often we're going to refer to trans youth experience, but we need to take into consideration that depending where the youth is situated, uh, whether their age, 
or whether their class or whether you know uh, their, their cultural background their experience will really vary so we don't want to see it as a monolithic experience so i'm going to try to bring the emphasis on that as we move and there is um you know a real lack of services for those young people and they continue to face many barriers in accessing them so i've spoke about the webinar series so in three part basic concept today so if we want to understand um you know the experience of trans youth we need to start understanding that sex is not the same than gender identity and it's not the same than sexual orientation and it's not the same than gender expression. So the first thing is really to understand what those concepts are and how they interact with one another. So when we talk about sex, normally we're going to talk about a medical legal category. That is when we have a child at birth, we're going to examine the child and often assign a sex based on um, you know, external sexual organ. But what's important to know is that this assign at birth sex is going to have a really big impact on a legal category that people will carry uh, through different piece of ID through their birth certificate. So that's why the sex is a medical and legal category. And currently in most provinces, we've got an M and an F, but we'll kind of also have like the X in some provinces. So the sex is really basically made of hormones, gonades, genitals, but also has got a link with the way we're going to live our civil life through ID. When we talk about gender expression, we talk about the way that a person is going to act and communicate gender within a given culture. So everyone here has got a gender expression. Some people might decide to express it more in a feminine way. Some people might decide to express it in a more masculine way, but everyone will have different gender expression. And they are usually, they might be or may not be consistent with socially prescribed gender roles in society. And they might or might not reflect our own gender identity. I.e. I could feel I identify as a woman, but I could express my gender identity differently, my gender expression differently, sorry. Then we've got the sexual orientation, which is the physical and emotional attraction we might have towards some other people. And then it's something that is totally different from gender identity. And I'm not going to get into the detail, but we've got different sexual orientation. But different people with different gender identity may have different sexual orientation. And it's not at all the same. So when we talk about gender identity, what it is, it is a profound personal experience that person experience. It can correspond or not to the sex assigned at birth. For example, a person can have a, a M assigned at birth, but deep inside themselves feel like a woman, feel like a female. So basically, the gender identity is our own personal relationship to oneself. It's only ourselves who can define who we identify. And I've put a citation here from Erenza, who say that our core gender identity lies between our <laughs> doesn't lie not between our legs, but between our ears. So it's the messages from our brain, okay? And the gender identity, so it's really the way that we see each other. We see ourselves. It's our own identity. And we could talk about different type of identity. And I'm sure you will all agree that one's identity can only be defined by the person themselves. I cannot define someone else's identity. Only the person can define how they feel about themselves. And when we talk about gender identity, we should be careful to understand that basically gender identity is not necessarily something that is binary. So we often talk about being feeling female or male, but there's a, a right range of, of, of gender identity that can be non-binary. So that means that you could feel both, <laughs> neither, or you could feel somewhere in between. When we talk about someone who is a, a trans youth, well, it's a young person that's a, that has a gender identity that is different from their sex assigned at birth. So it's not always someone who will feel completely the opposite. It's just someone who will feel that their gender identity is different from what we assign them at birth. So it could be someone who's been assigned male at birth, but feel like a female or vice versa or all, all sorts of different gender identity. And as I said, only a person can assert their gender identity. 
uh, we will see it a bit later, but when we talk about a, a, a child, we're going to also often see uh, persistence, insistence, and consistence in that in, in their expression of identity. So they will often come back to that, but we'll, we'll talk about it a bit later. So here you've got a little gender unicorn that explains a little bit better how gender identity, gender expression, sex assigned at birth, attraction, and emotion can play in, you know, in everyone. So everyone could be that little gender unicorn. So everyone will have some sort of like physical attraction, which is represented by the little heart. The little um, rainbow represents the way you feel within yourself. Then you've got like the little sex chromosome at the bottom. And then you've got like the little green dot that represents the expression. And so everyone can find themselves on those little dots. And so everyone can find themselves on the on, on the web of the gender unicorn. So basically everyone is different. So when we look at um, the experience of trans children, we need to look at the child development. Um, I am sure some of you have uh, done a little bit of child development theory at university during the training. We often have the classic views of Piaget and Goldberg theory that will focus on stage of development of the child. When we work with trans youth, and I think the, generally speaking, we're starting to criticize more and more those theory. I'm not going to get into the detail, but for example, we know that Colesberg theory has been developed just with a sample of male. So it is not applicable worldwide and it's not applicable to everyone. So basically today, we do not believe that there's a fixed stage of universal path and we need to understand children a little bit differently. What we know though, in terms of like transgender children, is that most of them will identify their gender by the age of three. And the same will happen for children who are socially transitioned. When we talk about a child who is socially transitioned, we are referring to a child who have expressed their gender identity and who have been allowed by the family to live their authentic gender identity. So that is a child that perhaps could be assign female at birth, but is allowed to express, live their identity as a male, for example, which is a very binary example, but just to give you an example. So you can see here that the gender identity can be affirmed very early. I mean, Diane Renzov even talk about the age of two. What we know also is that nearly 30% of trans youth knew about their gender identity before the age of eight. So often people are asking, is it too young to know? The answer is no, because people know about their gender, and gender identity very young. When it's question of a child that is not trans, so we will talk about a child that is cisgender, those children affirm their identity from the age of two. I'm sure if yourself think about when did you know you were who you are, you will be able to say that it was very early on. So when we look at the experience of trans youth, we know that most of them knew from very early on. Some of them will know between the age of 8 and 11 and some other a little bit later. It's not because the child realized that they are trans or that they identify otherwise from their gender assigned at birth that they are not trans. As I said, the gender identity is only the person can define it themselves. You need to understand also that not everyone will be able to express their gender identity to others. So we often see that uh, children, I, I still do work with, with children in, in Montreal, with the family of children in Montreal, and there's some children who affirm their gender identity really young, some other not. Why is that? Is that often we have like barrier to expressing the gender identity. We know, for example, that from preschool age, pressure of gender stereotype and to comply is very important. For example, 65.2% of transgender and gender questioning youth in a study did not tell anyone before they answer a question, a survey at around 15 and 16 years old. So basically, a lot of young people may feel that they identify otherwise than their sex assigned at birth, but they will not tell people. There's also a very important fear of rejection or threat of violence. There's uh, some young people who are very, very worried about coming out to their parents, for example. This is something we're going to discuss more in detail next week during the other webinar. But there's some young people who have 
uh, waited and waited to do a coming out to their parents because they were very worried about the reaction they would have. So it's not because a young person expressed their gender identity later on. So that I think that's something always, that they always, sometimes they can sometimes sometimes they differently. differently. Right. Prevalence. I, I've put a, a little um, citation from, um, from a research with parents here that say that transgender children are like baby pigeons. They exist, but nobody seems to notice them. I don't know if you have ever noticed baby pigeons, someone on the street, but they're very rare. But it's not because we don't see them that they're not there. So basically, there's a lot of transgender children, but we don't just see them. So I think we've got to, to realize that, that it's a population that is often invisible. Um, to know how many trans youth or trans children exist, we need to first of all define what it is to be trans. And as I said, it's only the person who can define, you know, who they are. So it's very difficult to have like a statistic. I mean, the statistic could be much higher. There's people who would not want to say it in a survey. So we've got to take those numbers with very much care. But according to um, some, some new surveys, we're talking that about 0.7% and 1.3% of children would be trans. So it is quite a lot of young people when we look at like the population in general. And over that, we need to add about 2% to 2.5% of young people who would be questioning their gender or being gender non-conforming. So all in all, it is like just under 5%. It is a very diverse population. I've mentioned it earlier in terms of age, in terms of culture, in terms of gender, gender identity, social economic income, parental support. So not every young people experience the same thing. But there is um, quite a lot of young people, but sometimes we don't see them because they might not come out to us by, by fear of not being supported, or maybe they will decide that they, they live stealth. So sometimes it's not because we don't see, you know, a, a population that they don't exist. Is it a phase or stable identity? There's been a lot of question about that. Um, for a long time, we have, the, the study have told us that basically, a large percentage of children who identified as trans were going to not pursue as trans when they grow up. So this is studies that were built like early 90s. Here you've got like a citation of soccer. Um, who was talking about a large percentage of these children who would basically desist. However, more and more, we know that uh, what we would call a detransition rate are very, very, very small. Um, there's been um, lots of critique of those earlier study in terms of methodological, interpretative, theoretical, and ethical flaws. We can give you some, um, some reference to read yourself if you want about that. I'm not going to go too much into detail, but um, some of the critique was, for example, that not every children that were enrolled on those study those studies were really actually trans. Uh, there's been like some children who were not aware of the participation of the study, and there's other ethical flaws that could be uh, raised. So you can go to read the studies about that. I think what it's important to know is that the um, the rate is actually quite low. If we look at a uh, a new study, a study from 2014 from the Rise. Out of 70 uh, young people who started a hormone treatment have continued with their transition in, uh, into adulthood. There's none of the participants who reported regret during puberty suppression or treatment or after gender affirming um, surgery. So there's basically um, very little children, young people who decided not to carry on with the transition. And uh, I was actually in uh, Argentina um, a couple of weeks ago, and there were a new study actually from, from the UK who look at a number of patients, 303 patients, adults for those, but basically the, the transition rate is very, very little. So we need to be very careful with that. And again, it's not about thinking that um, there might be some detransition rate, but more about taking the person where they are. But I just wanted to kind of name those things because sometimes it's a question. What about if the child changed their mind? Why, why should we support them not knowing what the outcome would be? 
Well, it's not about the outcome. It's more about how the child feels at the moment that they express their gender identity. We'll talk about it a little bit later. What we know is that transgender children who are supported by their family um, and socially, they have a strong, consistent, and embedded identity as young cisgender children have. Cisgender children, as I said, they are children who are basically um, identifying um, the same way than their sex assigned at, at birth. So basically, when we support a child, when there's a child who uh, transition, who decide who, that we accompany to, to live according to their own authentic gender identity, basically, th that child will have like a really strong identity. And so debate persists, but policy document and research, they will more and more support the affirmation of the child's identity. So basically, what does that mean? Is that the more and more the policy document and the research evolve, we know that the best way to intervene with those children is really to go with their rhythm and affirm them in their true identity. You will probably hear about terms called gender dysphoria. Gender dysphoria is a diagnosis uh, that we have from the DSM-5. So in social work, we might not use that diagnosis because we don't diagnose people, but it's still important to know. And it can describe the distress that some people experience because of an incongruence between their sex and their gender identity. So you might experience dysphoria because you feel distressed because the way you feel does not fit with the way that you look. So that would be gender dysphoria. And it's often a, an experience that will be created um, by, by this feeling of incongruence. But I think it's important to also more and more to talk about social dysphoria which is a distress caused by people or institution not recognizing us as a person or not recognizing our gender identity. So I'll give you an example. You know, if you go to uh, a social services or a health service place and uh, you, you say, hi, uh, if I'm presenting myself as, you know, hi, I'm Mrs. Da Da Da, and someone say, no, you're Mr., that would create social dysphoria. So basically, social dysphoria is the, stress, the, is the distress caused by people not recognizing who you are. And it can it's very, very violent as an experience and is very alienating as experience. In, in kids, we'll often notice the persistence, the insistence, and the consistence in the articulation of their gender identity. So, and, and basically, not all children will experience their gen the gender dysphoria. So there's children who will be, you know, supported in who they are and they will grow up and they will feel totally comfortable with their body. So it's important to understand that not all trans children and young people will say, I feel really uncomfortable with my body. So it's really an interaction between the child's person and what's going on around them. And often to alleviate dysphoria, some people might have access to different forms of transition. So these different forms of transition, they are to help the person to align better their authentic gender self to uh, the way they feel. So there's different type of gender transition. So we can talk about, first of all, uh, well, start by the social transition because the younger children often will go through that first. And social transition is about uh, just starting to live as their true gender self. So often the, ch the person, the child, might start uh, changing the way they look. They might dress in the comf in the clothes that's the most comfortable for them. They might change their hair. Uh, if they are a bit younger, they might use makeup or decide to kind of you know present themselves otherwise. And they might also um, change their pronoun and they might change their name as well in every sphere of their life. So basically, that's a social transition. Some people will decide to go towards a legal transition. So that means that they will ask. Uh, um, the um, the office for civil civil status here in Quebec. It's the uh, yes, this place where you get you keep the birth certificate, basically to have a, a gender change on the birth certificate, and that would have like an impact, a really important impact on all the other piece of ID. So basically, basically a legal change would be to change your uh, sex marker from M to F, F to M. Unfortunately, we can't, there's no, there's no place for non-binary identities at the moment, except if I'm not mistaken in uh, British Columbia, where we can have 
uh, X, but most places still it's going to be just like the change between M and F or F and M. So that would be the legal transition. And then some people will go through medical transition, and we need to remember that not all those type of transition are, uh, you know, you don't need to do any of these medical or social or legal transition to be trans. Uh, again, as I said, it's only the person who can decide how they feel and what's the best for them. But some people will decide to have access to medical transition, and that would involve um, in adolescence, perhaps, um, you know, delaying puberty, um, with blockers, for example, or uh, using almonds uh, to uh, to get more feminine or masculine characteristic, and it could go up to surgery. Uh, but again, it is not necessarily to have a surgery to transition. So these are the different type of transition that a person could have, and they are very important because they can improve the gender or the social dysphoria. So being trans is not at all a problem. Um, the expression of gender characteristics, including identities, are not stereotypically associated with one ethnic sign at birth, as is, it's common and it's culturally diverse human phenomenon that should not be judged as inherently pathological or negative. So this is from the World Professional Association of Transgender Health that is made of the membership of this association. It's made of uh, trans people, but also researcher and clinician who are specialized in the field of trans, trans health. And basically, you know, they state basically that it's really not a problem, but it's really what's happening around the person that's going to cause all that distress. So trans and gender variant identities are not a medical or psychological. G diversity of gender is not the result of a disease nor of a parenting style. So this is from the Canadian Pediatric uh, Society, uh, 2018. So basically, you know, since the big, since very long, since a long, long way, you know, there's always been uh, children and young people who are of diverse gender. And I think what caused the problem is really the way we see gender in our society. And, you know, we force people to adopt like a very binary way of experiencing their gender and living it. But in many culture, uh, for example, in, in many indigenous culture, uh, the, um, you know, be spiritual people were uh, not only existing, but also um, celebrated and put in different roles that were really important in society. So I think, you know, in, in contemporary Western society, we tend to maybe talk less about trans people, but it's always being people, trans people are always being there. So beyond social dysphoria, we can find that non-acceptance and transphobia in society is generally what causes a lot of problems to trans people. And so we know that generalized absence of social acceptability of trans youth and transgender identity more generally cause the problem. It's the experience of stigma and transphobia that will cause a psychological distress and low self-esteem. Um, we could refer also to the minority stress theory, which will explain the health disparity in sexual minority, including trans people, um, because of the stress that is caused by transphobic and hostile environment, which in turn will affect physical and mental health outcome. You know, if you live in a place where you're not accepted, obviously it's going to have a, an impact on your well-being and your, on your level of stress. So there's a real, real strong impact of the social on the individual. And we'll see next week when we talk about trans youth experience, it's very easy to trace how the different social environment how they can impact on the young person's well-being. Uh, we'll talk, for example, uh, of, of the uh, young people when they're not supported by their families, how it has a negative impact on their health. So if we look at the intervention model to work with children and family, there's three approaches to working with them that can be found in the literature. There's a model of the live in your own skin, this is the watchful waiting model and the gender, gender affirmating, affirmative model. The live in your own skin, I think it's more and more criticized uh, in the literature. Um, you see here, there's a, a, um, a citation from the World Professional Association of Transgender Health that say that treatment aim at trying to change a person's gender identity and expression to become more congruent with the sex assigned at birth has been attempted in the past without success. 
particularly in the long term. Such a treatment is no longer considered ethical. So here, the WPATH refers to the model live in your own skin model, which basically would, uh, you know, try to work with the child and make them accept the fact that they got like a sex assigned at birth and that their gender identity should fit within that. So this model is now considered very unethical, but I wanted to mention that it has been around and, uh, you know, there might be some professional who still try to apply it, but it is unethical and it's an abuse of power. Actually, Canadian Association of Social Work has made a very strong statement on that. There's also um, the watchful waiting model, which basically was thinking, okay, we might not want to support the child to transition. Now we'll just wait and see what's happening. So it does not serve the child because critical support is withheld. So if you say, you know, yes, you might be trans, you might not be trans, we'll just wait. You're not giving the support that the child need at the moment as they're growing up. So watchful waiting is based on a binary notion of gender in which gender diversity and fluidity is pathologized. In watchful waiting, it is also assumed that notion of gender identity become fixed at a certain age. So most robust research uh, and current research suggests that rather than focusing on who the child will become, valuing them for who they are, even at a young age, foster secure attachment and resilience, not only for the child, but also for the whole family. So basically the gender affirming model is the model that is uh, the model that we should privilege, is the model that basically will follow the child's lead and will follow what the child, will follow the child's um, expression of their gender identity and will just be around to support that gender identity, whatever it is, knowing that it might change and it might evolve with time, but not focusing on the outcome, but just on the moment that the child is experiencing. So the basic principle and goals of the gender affirming model. First of all, we need to understand that gender variations are not disorder. So we know that gender is not something that is binary. Yes, there might be some people who feel very female, some others may feel very male, but there's a wide range of ways of expressing gender and feeling gender. So there's people who are gender non-binary and it's not a disorder to feel different. Gender presentation are diverse and varied across culture, requiring cultural sensitivity. So basically we understand that even in the Western model, there's more two gender fixed as male and female. This is not across all culture and we need to respect that people might express their gender identity differently, even within one culture. Gender involve interweaving over time of biology, development and socialization and culture and context. So basically, we know that gender is not the same as gender identity is not the same as sex so we need to be careful about that and that it might develop differently from one person to another we also know that gender may be fluid and it's not always binary it can be fluid across like a, a lifespan as well it's not because at eight years old the child affirm a certain gender that that person will affirm the same gender later on so it might be fluid it might evolve if present, individual psychological and psychiatric problems are more often than not secondary to negative interpersonal and cultural reaction to a child. So as we said, often when a child is, um, you know, um, is, is experiencing some difficulty, it's not because of their trans identity, but because of the way that people interact around that child and because that identity might be pathologized and because the child might experience stigma discrimination and violence for, be, for being who they are. And gender pathology lies more in culture than in the child. You know, what makes um, a, a child not being accepted for who they are when they start expressing their gender differently from their sex assigned at birth? It's because society say that there's just two gender. So basically it is real, the, it's really the cultural pressure that will affect and make people think that it's a pathology more than the, the child itself. So it is not a pathology, it's really uh, something that is built culturally. So the goal of the affirming model is to facilitate an authentic gender self. So it's really to follow the child's lead and 
accept and celebrate children for who they are, whatever the gender they express or they identify with. It's to also alleviate gender stress and distress. This can go through very different ways, and we're going to talk about it in the different uh, in the other uh, webinar. But you know, alleviating stress or distress might mean uh, having to work really closely with the school to make sure that the child can express their gender identity uh, as they please in the school. It might mean also having to. Uh, change uh, structure <laughs> in different environment. Um, it might need, and this is where social work can be very helpful because we don't work with just people. We work also with environment. But one of the goal of the affirming model will be to really try to alleviate that gender stress and distress by changing the structure that are um, stigmatizing and transphobic and not supportive into something that is more adapted to every single child, whatever their gender. It's also going to be to build gender resilience. This is going to happen a lot by affirming the gender identity and so that the person, the child can feel that you know, they are, they can build a good self-esteem, they can feel good about themselves and they can feel that they're respected for their own gender. And it's also about securing social support to make sure that the child has got the support they need to be able to experience their own gender. Affirming gender identity. So more robust in current research suggests that rather than focusing on who a child will become, valuing them for who they are, even at a young age, fosters secure attachment and resilience, not only for the child, but also for the whole family. So we'll see it's very, very important that we work with both, especially when they're little. There's not much to do with the child apart from celebrating for who they are. We need to work with the whole family so that family become accepting and also that the family can be resilient to social pressure that might, you know, uh, make barrier for, for the child's uh, well-being. We can facilitate the, the gender affirming model by a different type of transition, as I said, by legal, in changing the gender marker on birth certificate, civil document, social, by adopting gender expression, coherent to authentic gender identity, use of pronoun, name to reflect this, or by medical, use of puberty blocker, hormones, or the surgery. And it's important, as I said, to know that not everyone will decide to go through any type of transition, and we just need to follow what the person wants to do. So basically, the concept of um, informed consent, the concept of self-determination are very important to working with trans youth and their family. <coughs> Sorry about the dog. <laughs> oh. um, that's very disturbing. Okay, social work intervention and gender affirming practice. Oh gosh. Sorry. Chester, come on. I'm very sorry about that. So social work intervention and gender affirming practice. So we will uh, try to work towards uh, getting intervention among young person, among family, and also we'll try to develop social and structural uh, level intervention. And all of that will be in the aim of facilitating long-term change. So here you can see some resources to the joint statement for social work practice with trans youth that was um, adopted both by the Canadian Association of Social Work Educator yeah. and the Canadian Association of Social Work. And also I invite you to visit the web rep repertory of the uh, Quebec Association of Social Worker, uh, but it's only in French. So I think we're going to take some questions now. We said we're going to keep about 40 minutes. I'm sorry, there's a postman. Sally? Thank you. 
I can't oh, hear sorry. you. Sorry, we were muted. Thank you, um, thank you Annie, um, sorry about the <laughs> for the presentation. And uh, I've already got questions coming in, and but there's still time to type them in. So if you haven't yet, you still can, and I can add them to the list. So um, I want to go back to the beginning of the presentation because I've gotten a number of questions about the, the unicorn graphic that you showed us. Um, yeah. People are just asking if you could explain a little bit more about what um, a non-binary gender looks like. And specifically the question that has come up a lot is, could you explain a bit more about what an other gender is? Yes. So I like that little gender unicorn because if you look at gender identity, the first, uh, the first, um, the first category at the top, you see, you can have towards more female women and girl, towards more male men and boys, and towards other. If you want to have good reading about a uh, different gender identity, there's the book of um, from Diane Irenza, who explain different ways of expressing expressing gender, but she talk about some people who might feel both male and female, or they might feel neither. And I know that it might be a little bit differ, differ, difficult to grasp <laughs> uh, when you are a binary person because you have no reference in your own person to understand that. But we need to understand that gender is very constructed in a, in a binary way in, in, our, in our society. So for many people, there's just two options, either we male or we female. But when we think about that, there's really many different ways of expressing that gender identity if you are um, really listening to who you are. Maybe someday you're feeling more men. Sometimes maybe you feel more women. Maybe that doesn't happen to you. But it's not because it doesn't happen to one person that it can't happen to other persons. So basically, we need to understand that that concept of like being just female or male is very westernized as concept and that gender identity, because it's different from the, uh, the sex assigned at birth, basically there's many other ways of, 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 of living it. Uh, Diane and Renzaf, she talks about, for example, uh, gender priors, gender, gender smoothie. Only the person can really define how they feel in terms of their gender identity. I don't know if that answered the question a little bit. No, I, I think definitely, yeah, that's really, really helpful for folks. Um, so, Mate from Ontario is uh, asking a question. Um, I've heard parents use the information that gender can be treated throughout life to support the idea that hormone use or surgery shouldn't be supported. So what's a good response to that? Well, I would say that only the person can define what they need for themselves. It's sure that, you know, there's the question of consent. Uh, you know, first of all, surgeries are not accept, you know, they're not accessible, um, you know, before uh, the age of majority. Sometimes for some type of surgery, it might be like late teenagehood, you know, like 17, 16, like top surgery, things like that. But, you know, surgeries, you're not, the person is not going to have access to that before they are really able to make their own decision. So I think we just need to follow again the person's lead. You know, only the person can decide what's best for them, and maybe what they need. It's not what we see as person as something. Uh, you know, you you could you could um, you could feel like a woman, and you just need to feel. You just need to follow the person's lead. That's the that's the only mm -hmm. principle we need to to, to go uh, when they are younger person. Even if gender is fluid, well, because gender is fluid, we should uh, we should even more follow them and and try not to kind of place them into a gender binary. So you know, because you need to remember that you know when they are young, the children they often um, will express their gender through you know clothing, through 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 uh, through toys, through things, through through play, and so basically you know just to follow that. It's, it's just going to help the child uh, understand themselves better and, and feel that they can be really themselves. So, you know, if we look at clothes, uh, you know, if a child was assigned uh, female at birth and really like male masculine clothing, even the child is fluid and carry on to define their gender identity through time, there's nothing wrong with offering them the type of gender clothing that they, they feel the most comfortable. 
I, I, I like to tell people, try to imagine yourself if you were forced to go to work every day with, you know, apparel, with like clothing that don't fit who you are really. And day after day, we force you to wear some clothes that don't fit with who you are inside. I mean, you can see very rapidly how you would feel bad and you wouldn't be able to focus on the important stuff, for example, what you need to learn at school. So even if you've got like a child that is very gender fluid, I think the message is the same. And it's about following the child's lead and making sure that they've got access to what they need to be able to flourish and express themselves. That's, that's a really great answer. Um, before I end. So Raquel from Nova Scotia says, I love the term social dysphoria because it pathologizes the culture instead of the individual. But then Serena from Newfoundland adds, the fact that gender dysphoria is listed in the DSM must contribute to the idea that it's an illness and a therapy and not just a way of being. Yeah, I mean, gender dysphoria, it's not being trans. <laughs> Gender dysphoria is a distress that comes when you feel that maybe some characteristics don't fit with your gender identity. So some people experiencing gender dysphoria may need to have access to medical, medical transition because this is the way that they will feel better. So, you know, it's, uh, again, it's about, it's, 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 it's not just about social dysphoria. It's not about just gender dysphoria. I think it's about, it's about both and really make sure that the person with us has got all the different access to services that they need to be able to themselves decide what is the main concern here. Is the main concern because, you know, is, is the main concern of a trans youth here um, distress caused by the fact that they realize their voice is getting deeper and because they're starting to notice, you know, hair in their face and or because they're developing breasts or because they've got menses is that the main you know cause for distress because they feel that there's an incongruence between who they feel really and what their body is telling them or is it because the child the, the person the, the young person is uh, confronted every day to people not wanting to use the right pronoun or not mm. you know um really um you know, respecting the, the name. I mean, you know, we should be respecting. I mean, one of the one important cause for distress of young people. We're going to talk about it more next week. But um, it's it's about not having their name or pronoun, um, you know, recognized. So it's being misgendered and you know having the wrong name and the wrong pronoun used over and over. So this is like what we see. In terms of like more social dysphoria, people refusing to honor people's identity. So I think it's really kind of a mix of both. Although, I, you know, as I said, gender dysphoria is really a, a diagnostic kind of term from the DSM. It doesn't take away the experience that some people have. Mm. Um, this is a, a bit more practical. Uh, we've got a few people asking if you could explain a bit more those three terms we use. Persistence, insistence, and consistence. Yeah. Okay. Again, we don't want to use that as a diagnostic tool. Yeah. So it's not a way to diagnose people because basically, if you say whatever the child becomes, it will become, they will become, you don't even have to worry about that. But often you will see that some children, you know, people say, oh, is that a phase? You know, is, is my child just going through a phase? Often what you will see is that some kids will, will be very persistent in expressing a certain gender, very insistent in the way they're expressing it, and very consistent as well through the time in expressing it. So that's what we say. But it's not, you know, even if you've got a child that is just experiencing with different like gender gendered toys or you know gendered clothes it doesn't mean that you should not follow them so what i'm saying is that we need i think to stop focusing on the outcome you know there's no one can predict 100 percent what the person will become so it's not about focusing on the outcome but more focusing on 
what the child needs at the moment, what the child needs at the time we are working with them. Mm. My next one is more practice oriented. Um, she says, Darla from Alberta says, I'm working with a uh, trans youth who's living in a group home. Everyone's calling me youth by a preferred name and a preferred pronoun. And the mom is trying very hard to come to terms with this, but having difficulty due to, to grieving her child. And mom is not open to therapy. Do you have suggestions on how to support the mom? Yes. Um, well, I mean, we, we have a, a current study. Um, actually on, on, on the experience of parents. And so this is something that we see in about, we saw that in about a third of the sample, uh, parents experiencing uh, a lot of grief, grieving process through their child. Mm -hmm. And I think what seems to help is, you know, I mean, it's always a balance between honoring the identity of the kids and taking the space to, you know, to grieve and to, do, to go through your process. I would say that, you know, you can go through your process, but you should still, even if it's difficult for the mom, you should try to put the best of interest of the child and still honor the gender identity of that child. Okay, Because in the end, we know that kids who are supported by their parents and that they've got like they are, uh, they are respected in their gender identity. Um, I've got a better health outcome, yeah? So, so we'll talk about it next week, but this is like something we know. At the same time, we know that some parents are struggling and to help them struggling, sometimes we need time to do that. But we also need a lot of education. We need to, to be able to give parents a lot of accurate information and that often will help them to come to terms uh, with, with the idea that their child is trans and also give them access to different support. Either peer support, uh, there's fantastic group across Canada. Uh, there's a Facebook group that is mainly Eng uh, English speaking, but it's called the Canadian uh, Parents of Gender Diverse and Trans Children. This is a, so if you look on Facebook, it's a, a massive group of parents. So peer support might help the person be able to kind of go to normalize the, the experience that they've got and also sometimes it's to seek professional help mm. so to have access to you know a psychologist or a therapist to to help through that grieving process but i would say you know i think it's about educating the parents and say yes it's difficult yes we know some parents have got issues accepting it but think about the importance of affirming your kid's identity because there's such an improvement in mental health when this is done right um another kind of a practice oriented question um janae from alberta says do you have suggestions for fostering acceptance in the classroom of young trans children and she's thinking like ages four to nine yeah that's a good question i think it's about you know creating space for every children to exist you know it's 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 about it's about creating it's about trying to um develop activities where things are not necessarily gender all the time i know in class we we often kind of i mean i don't know if it's like that across canada but i know that we often here in my part of the country <laughs> separate groups by okay guys on one side girls on the other side and you know with two lines or uh, you know girls doing that activity so try to kind of think about activities that are more gender neutral and try to also find books and literature that is uh, you know that present different model of gender uh, there's again we could perhaps at the end of that webinar put some resources in terms of books uh, for children that present different genders um, there's there's um, Sophie Labelle um, BD uh, with like um, a fantastic kind of resources you can use for children. There's also a, a tool that's been developed by uh, Gender Creative Kids Canada, uh, which is called SAM. It's um, mm. uh, it's a, um, a nesting doll uh, that talk about the child transitioning, but not transitioning, but more expressing their gender and the different stages of emotional development. So if you go to gendercreativekids.ca, you can have a look at SAM. There's certainly a film a little short animation that is really really nice that you can present to the kids and you know open discussion about it and say what did you see in that film 
You know, why is Sam like dressed in pink to start with and then express like a boy later? Is that okay? Can everyone feel like that? Is there anybody who feels differently? And you can express, I think it's about building empathy in the classroom and making sure that children know that everyone is allowed to feel their own gender and feel, you know, differently. Mm. Um, I'm, could you just repeat just the name of the Facebook group? I've had like six people ask me to repeat that. The Facebook book, the Facebook group is called, I think, Canadian Parents of Trans and Gender Diverse Children. But I will check and I will give you the exact name. They've got Thank like you. a front page and it's a, um, it is a, um, a private secret group. So you will find people who want to find it. It's for parents, right? So it's not for professionals. But that could be a good resource. And there's like a front page that can kind of screen people. And then you've got like a private page for, for parents' uh, support. Okay, yeah, that's very really helpful. That's really helpful. I, think I think people are working with families and going to the um, parents and working with families. Yeah. Um, um, this one is about, what's the difference? They have, I have some anxiety about knowing what to call people, like what their pronouns are. Is there a best practice to ask children these kinds of questions? How can you be respectful knowing that they're, that it's different in two young kids? Sorry, uh, can you repeat the question? It was not really clear to me. Yeah, so um, this person is saying that they have, I'm combining a few questions here, but many people have written in saying they have a bit of anxiety knowing what to call people and how to ask children what their preferred pronouns are. Um, is there a best practice, practice to ask kids these kinds of questions? Being respectful? Okay, so if I understand well, because it's kind of interference there, but if I understand yeah. well, it's like, how do we, uh, how do we, Make sure we ask the person's pronoun. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, this is something I think we should all get into using that because we always assume <laughs> and, and, and we shouldn't assume, you know, I mean, you can just, you know, start a conversation saying, hi, I'm Annie. I like, you know, I, I like to use female gender pronoun. What about you? <laughs> mm. And, you know, it's just to get used to that. Because it's not something we do often. Sometimes it might be like, oh, is that all right? But I think, you know, you better to ask than assume. This is based on, on the conception that everyone is cisgender, yeah? But not everyone yeah. is cisgender. There's a lot of people who are trans. And so I think it's very respectful to ask what, what pronoun people want to use. So I think when you take the initiative to present yourself saying, you know, I am Annie, I like to use female pronoun. <laughs> Or if you got like name badge to live a place for putting the pronoun, you know, that's a really inclusive um, practice. Mm. And you know, if people don't understand why you do that, you can just explain, I do that because I understand that there's a lot of trans folks around and I want to make sure I'm inclusive. It's, um, it's such a simple answer. Like it's uh, so good to think about it in that way. Um, to, we only have two minutes left and this is a, I thought it was such an interesting question to end on. Sarah um, from Manitoba is asking, "Do you would you like to see the world move towards gender neutral names for kids? Do you think that matters? Um, is it fine for kids just to choose a different name if they end up feeling different? Uh, we're just interested in your perspective. Hmm. That's a good question. I, I thought it was novel. I, you know, I, I, I believe in choices, yeah? I believe in, 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 in diversities and in choices. You know, I, I, don't, I don't think, well, there's so many answers to that. I personally don't think that I need to have a sex marker on my IDs to be able to express myself as a female, yeah? So whether on my driving license or on my, you know, Medicare card, I have no F, I, I would, I, I think, you know, understanding the experience of trans youth, that would make it so much easier for everyone if we didn't have a, 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 a legal gender marker on every single, you know, because in, in the end, what does it represent? It's just like genitals. <laughs> you know, what's on your ID is basically a representation of your genitals. So for me, I mean, 
personally, I don't, I don't need that to affirm myself as a woman. I'm not saying that we don't need any, you know, I think it's about people to have the space to exist, whatever that place is. Um, and I think it's about facilitating, uh, the, putting into place system where everyone can exist, not just people who are cisgender and identify as female and male. I don't know if it answers your question, but you know, for me, it's, it's, it's not about having everything gender neutral. It's about letting the people existing outside of those things and changing the system so those people can exist and stop being erased. Uh, because currently, you know, a lot of people are being erased in the system because it's still very binary. So it's not about crushing, you know, everything and that there's nothing existing, but it's about leaving the space for everyone to be able to find it. I um, I think that's an awesome answer. Um, and I'm aware that we're already over the hour. Also, I just wanted to acknowledge to the audience I've been getting all of your messages. I'm so sorry. I know that there was feedback uh, when I was speaking to Annie, um, asking the questions. We're really sorry about that. Sometimes technology friend and foe, um, and we'll try to get it fixed for next time. Uh, so just so you know, I, we are aware of it. We are working on it. Just it's hard to fix things on the fly during a live event sometimes. So thank you for bearing with us, and we hope that you still enjoyed it. Um, with that, I have to say a huge another thank you to you, Annie. Um, we got so many questions today. People were super engaged. I think you taught us a lot. And I hope everyone's looking forward to part two and part three, which you can still sign up for. And uh, with that, have a great afternoon or morning or evening, depending on where you are. And we'll see you next time.